Well, church, uh, today I've got a message specific for Artisan Turns 3. Then we've got Palm Sunday, and then we'll have Easter Sunday, and uh, then we'll launch a brand new series right after Easter. But how many of you um, appreciated uh, my good friend, Pastor Micah Mack, last week? You guys love the word he brought. Um, just an incredible speaker and even better, just human. Uh, Micah is just one of the best people I know. Um, and so, so grateful um, that his, uh, our family was uh, spending some family time together for spring break, that he was able to come in and um, just preach an incredible word. Uh, but today, um, really felt this drop strongly in my heart a couple weeks ago as I was asking the Lord, hey, what do we want to talk about? You know, again, at this um, year three of being artisan and all that that entails. And I really felt a draw back to one of our values. And if you don't know, our church has five values. We teach them at Welcome Home Lunch, which is a, basically a, a, about once a month, we gather with anybody who wants to be a part of Artisan Church, newer people, and talk through what it means uh, to be a part of Artisan. What does it look like to be a part of this community of faith? And every single Welcome Home Lunch, we highlight those five values. So sometimes for Renee and I, we feel like we're talking about it all the time. All of our staff goals, they orient all of their goals around our values. We want value-driven goals. Uh, we don't just want uh, words up on a, a wall. We actually want to try to live this and build this way. But we haven't taken a moment and just highlighted some of these values within the church on a Sunday morning in a while. And so uh, today, one of those values that I really want to hit is the value of outreach. Um, if you don't know, uh, as a believer, this is a really important time to um, actually ask some questions about how do you view outreach and evangelism? Because it's a time where people are open to conversations about faith. Um, over 90% of our nation celebrates Easter um, and actually sees it as a holiday worth celebrating. And so within this moment comes this faith opportunity. We know statistically speaking that 63% of Americans who don't attend church would go to church on Easter if somebody invited them. Uh, that if they knew they had somebody to sit with, that if somebody would bring them to church, which by the way, we've got invite cards on all the seat backs and uh, ushers will be handing out more of them on the way out. And this, if you've been in church for a while, you could be like, this is so obligatory. Uh, pastor just wants butts in seats. I know his heart. I know what he's about. I know what these invite cards mean. Not at all. This is a moment in time where people are open to a faith conversation. And sometimes a little card can be a little spark, a little conversation point, a little moment where you can um, open that door to a faith conversation. But really today I want to preach not just on what does it look like to invite a friend to church. Let's go way deeper. Let's go far broader than that. Let's dive into what does missional living look like? What does it actually look like to as a believer, a follower of Jesus, live like you're on mission? And so often, I think one um, thing that I, I, I do love about um, the church movement we're a part of is, is we value missions. And um, as a church, uh, we gave substantially to overseas missions last year. We're investing, we're sending people, we're, we, we're, we're believing, we're, we're supporting missionaries monthly. And, and that's incredible. But so often what be, happens is the word mission or missions becomes synonymous with those who are willing to go overseas. And so it can sort of, not obviously intentionally, that's probably not our hearts, but we can sort of fall prey to, yeah, I give to missions, but, but I'm not on mission. Like I support missions. I'm all for it. Project 42, reaching the 42% of unreached people. Woo, let's go. I'll write the check on Builder's Offering Sunday. And that's amazing. But then what we can do is we sort of delegated missional living. Like that's for those who are called, except actually the challenge is we're all called according to his purpose. <laughs> we all have a calling. We all have a mission. That we have the great co-mission that we live under to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. This is actually not something you can delegate 
or pay. Like I think about, again, like whenever you sign up as a parent for sports and there's volunteer hours and you can either write a check or volunteer. This is not something where you can just write the check and say, I gave this mission to somebody else. I've delegated my, uh, my part to them and I want them to go for me. Missional living is the call to the Christians. And it's interesting because the more we drift from missional living, we actually start to become, we can get into sort of dangerous waters that start to uh, look a little bit like hypocrisy, right? Like I know what I believe and, and I know what I've signed up for, but like you, you, you wouldn't really know it if you were around me. Like you wouldn't really hear about it if I worked with you. And, and so this is a topic that is so important, and, and my mind went to one of, uh, in my opinion, one of the best um, words that millennials used all the time. Come on, how many of you know slang's always changing, and millennial slang is so outdated. It sounds so lame now. I was even trying to think of some of it, right? Like, I remember we'd always say legit. Now legit just sounds so lame. Say lit. Like we say something is lit. Are you kidding me? That's gross. You know, we'd even... We say, you're, you know, you're too legit. You're too legit to even quit. You know, like it's like millennial. It just sounds so lame now. But one that I just, I still talked about before. I just want to bring it back is poser. This is a great word. This is a great word is, is all the posers out there. People who are posing like they're something that they're not. And it was a big word in the skateboard scene in the early thousands that I was a part of because there was a lot of posers who would walk around with their skateboard. I remember the worst of it is I saw this kid at the skate park. And if you know how to actually, um, if, you, if you're a decent skateboarder, right, and you can actually grind on the rails, you get this sort of wear mark on your skateboard. And this would be sort of like a, like, like, like a mark that you were decent. And I remember seeing this kid and he had his skateboard up against a curb and he was rubbing it to get the, the wear mark. And I'm like, poser, you're a poser, right? Like that, that's, we had a word for it. Like you're, you're saying you're escaped. You're trying to look like you're a part of something and you're not, you haven't put the work in kid. You got to earn that. That's going to, you're, you're going to hurt yourself a lot before you get those marks. You, you, you got to bleed a little. You, you got to scrape your knees. You know, you, you, you got to, you got to hurt yourself in a lot of different ways if you're gonna do this. And so it's, you have to earn that spot. And so I wonder sometimes if, um, if maybe, if we're not careful, even with a good heart, we could sort of become a poser of a Christian. Like, like I'm, I, I believe that Christ died for me, but like you wouldn't know it. Like he bled for me, but I'm not bleeding for him. He sacrificed for me, but I, I'm not really sacrificing for him. He put it all on the line for me, but I'm not really putting it all on the line. I'll buy church merch and I'll look the part, but, but I don't, I'm not actually sacrificing. I'm not bleeding for it. I'm, not, I'm sort of like that kid scraping the skateboard on the curb going, I want to look the part, but on the inside I'm a mess or I'm not, not really living on, on mission. And, and I think one of the things that in, in these moments I, I really hope Throughout this message, you feel my heart. This isn't, um, I'm not here to try to guilt trip or just make people feel bad. But I think there's some important questions that I've been asking myself. And, and, and I'm just going to be honest, this takes a lot of work as a pastor to stay on missional living. You'd be like, what do you mean, pastor? You're, like, you're, you're preaching, like you do ministry for a job. Realize if I'm not careful, my whole world can become a bubble of Christian living. My whole world can be a bubble of just Christians and I can just be around Christians. I, I, we can get over Christianese. If I'm not careful, I start to sound like I've only hung out with Christians. So saying words like thus, like don't say thus. Like why saith, what are you, like, you King James? Like why are you speaking weird? You know, why, don't use words like saturate. It's kind of a gross word. Like don't, it's like right on the edge of moist. Like don't say saturate. Why are you? We, we, say, we say that things touched us way too much. Like there's too much touching going on. You know, like, dude, like hands off, bro. Like just, like we can start to sound a little odd. Like we can start to get our language and all of a sudden it feels odd and it can feel weird. So I actually have to actively work. I'm gonna be honest, I work with Christians. Hopefully our staff is saved, right? Did we check that, Renee, when we hired them? Check their salvation at the door. Um, but I work with Christians. I'm around Christians. So I have to go do things 
and get into the world where, 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 where there is things that people who aren't serving Jesus. This is where I do use different hobbies or hockey or things that I go to get around those spaces, right? I need to have names of people that I have a burden to reach. Do you have lost people? Do you, have, do you know names of people you're trying to reach? And sometimes that can pose a challenge. And you go, man, I don't even know how to get started on this. Where do I even begin? Like for me right now, there's a guy named Eric, and I know this guy, Eric, and, I, I, and, and I've had small faith conversations. I'm looking for any open door. Like, how do I reach Eric? Are you getting around people? Do you have names? Do you know them? Are you thinking missionally? And really, the missional living starts, from a biblical perspective, it starts with a burden. Do you have a burden for people who don't know Jesus yet? Do you actually feel emotional about the reality that they don't know Jesus? And even beyond just where is their eternity set, do you actually engage emotionally with the reality that they're living this life without their connection to Jesus? I was talking to a good friend of mine here at our church uh, uh, last Saturday. We were talking about what it looks like to to serve Jesus or not serve Jesus. We're like, what do people, I I can't even remember, this is how long I've been serving Jesus. I don't even remember, what do people do in the car? I mean, obviously podcasts, whatever. But I'm like, when I'm alone, I talk to Jesus. Like, who do they talk to? Like, do they just sit in silence? I was like trying to remember what they do, like in the car, because I'm like, I'm praying, I'm worshiping. Like, that's my time to connect. I just, I can't imagine a life of, uh, without that connection to Jesus and that support? Where do you go when, when, when you're really, really hurting? Where, where do you turn when you have a lot of questions? What, what do you do when you have a big decision? Do you just hope you get it right and you just roll in the dice and, and hoping it works out? Like if you don't have this connection, do, does our heart, do we feel the burden? You see, Jesus, he didn't offer us a burdenless existence. He said, hey, you have this ill-fitting, heavy-laden burden called sin on your life. And he says, I actually want to remove that burden. And I want to give you a healthy burden. He says, I want to exchange. I want to do a burden exchange. Take my yoke upon you, that which is easy and light. There is still a burden. His yoke may be easy and light, but there is a burden for people. Jesus, you cannot read the Gospels. And oh, please, church, um, it was interesting. We were at a, a pastor's gathering, and it was such an odd thing. But this, this uh, one of the pastors, it wasn't odd uh, in nature. We, this happens a lot. But she came up, she goes, hey, I just feel like God's telling me to tell you and Renee just to only read the Gospels right now. And we were like, done, okay. Like, we'll just read the Gospels right now. It just felt like a word from God. And so Renee and I, in our private time, we've been diving into uh, uh, the Gospels. And it's just so, sometimes we can get into a lot of study if you've been serving God for a while. Sometimes it's so refreshing just to read about Jesus and just to be reminded of how he lived. And man, this guy was on mission. He cared about the people that nobody else cared about. He cared about all those around him. He was looking for ministry opportunities everywhere he went. He had this missional living about him. He had this burden for the lost. He looked out and had sympathy on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Oh, trying to figure it out on their own. And we do, right? Sometimes, unfortunately, we can start chatting and talking like, oh, they're always making the wrong decision. I can't believe they made, of course they're making the wrong decision. (laughs) They don't have the Holy Spirit guiding and leading and, and prodding and moving them in the right direction and teaching them through peace. We have to have a heart. We have to have a burden for this. A dangerous prayer is, God, give me a burden for the people you care about. That is a dangerous prayer, church. Have you prayed? God, God, would you help me to see who you're really focused on right now? Because you leave the 99 and you go after the one. So I can complain about how you left me or I can follow you after the one. So would you give me a burden for the one? That is a dangerous prayer. It could change your whole life. Well, I mean, pastor, like I, I like assume like that's just sort of like what I'm thinking. No, pray it. Actually pray it. Give me eyes to see. I remember when I was trying to figure out 
hearing God's voice a bit on like who to focus on. I remember early on as a, as a youth pastor feeling overwhelmed by the amount of students that were coming who didn't know Jesus. And I felt sometimes like I was spinning my wheels. Like it almost wasn't being effective. And I said, Jesus, I want you to literally highlight to me. I, I, I want to be able to like not take my eyes off the kid that you really want me to spend time with tonight, that you really want me to get around. And I remember uh, he would do it. All of a sudden the Holy Spirit would lead me. And it was like this kid, my eyes would just lock in and I'm like them tonight. Like, and, and just help me to see with, with your eyes where people are at, who needs prayer, who needs some love, who, highlight them, highlight them. Where are they? Just, just bring them to my mind constantly. Would you remind me, give me a heart like yours. So I've got four questions for us today that will help us to develop this burden. If you would answer these questions honestly and maybe put yourself down as the answer, I believe something could get sparked in us missionally on reaching our neighbors. And the first question I wanna ask, and I wonder if you, I want you to think about all of the people in your life that don't know Jesus, that aren't in this room. Don't think about who's here. Would you think about the people that aren't, people who aren't in church today, right? That don't know Jesus, or maybe they did, they walked away, wherever they're at. But you know that they just, they need a fresh encounter with the presence of God, okay? I want you to just begin to think about them. Don't make this just about some general person. I want you to think of someone. Maybe you haven't talked to them in three years, or maybe God's highlighting them to your mind right now. So as I ask these questions, what do you think about them? First question, who will tell them? So who's going to tell them? Romans chapter 10, verses 12 through 14 says, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. This is a promise. Aren't you glad you found this promise? Aren't you glad that you were undeserving? That, that, that you had no business being saved, but when you called on him, Jesus met you there? Are you grateful? I should get an amen. I didn't get one amen. Nobody's grateful. Okay, interesting. Come on, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Well, they've like heard of Jesus. Yeah, but have they really heard about him? What I've begun to see is there's a lot of people who think they know Jesus, but they were introduced to a counterfeit. They were introduced to a second and third hand, stale, lifeless, historical account. They weren't introduced to the Jesus that they could know. They weren't introduced to the Jesus of the Gospels. Again, if you need a reminder, maybe, maybe that's a word for our whole church from that pastor that, hey, we should all be reading the Gospels right now because it helps to live on mission if you'd read the Gospels and go, oh, who's going to tell them about this Jesus? I'm going to give a teaser. This, most pastors would say not to do this, but on Easter, just so you know, I'm going to preach about the God you can know. That is the difference. Our God is not in a grave. Our God, you can't go visit some holy site of where Jesus' grave and his body is. We, we serve a God you can know who is alive and active and moving in the world. And he cares about you and he's personal. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna preach the gospel on Easter Sunday. I believe that's the only response to the message of Jesus. And we're gonna hear the whole gospel. People are gonna hear the whole gospel. So who's gonna tell them? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them is the end of that. How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And the moment there's that word preaching, because we're Americans and what I'm doing right now is what we call preaching. Pastor Sam's a preacher. Pastor Micah, he's a preacher. Pastor Philip, he's a preacher. So preachers. So then in this moment, you go, oh, sweet. Romans 10, verses 12 through 14, this is about preachers like him. So I can sit back again and I can delegate my need. But you have to understand what this word actually means. The word for preach here is the same Greek word for proclaim. And it is caruso, and it means to publicly announce. This is something that is included. This was for all believers. How will they know? How can they hear about him if you won't publicly announce about Jesus? How will they know if you don't talk about it? 
Now, I believe in quiet prayer moments. I believe in all of this, but this verse is not talking about quietly praying for them. This verse is not talking about just hoping and wishing and trying to like rub off on them a little bit with some, some Jesus love. Like this is not, this is talking about actively, publicly proclaiming, saying, hey, I want to have a conversation. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to find ways to do this. Now, obviously we want to use intelligence, right? There are wrong ways to publicly proclaim and there are right ways. If you go to a sporting event this year, you'll probably see somebody doing a way that I wouldn't necessarily advise, just sort of shouting over people. What I've found is it's a lot more valuable to preach to people than over people. And how do you preach to people? You preach to people by being human and letting them in on your story and what Jesus did for you. I'm going to tell you one of the best tools for preaching the gospel is what Jesus has done for you. But then there's a challenge there. Are you willing to talk about your weaknesses to other people? What if the reason the inroad's not there is because we don't want to get that vulnerable? We don't want to let people into those spaces. Because when you get vulnerable, people aren't likely to spit on you and slap you and shove you to the ground and say, stop it. Like, people are like, oh man, this is real. This is when you go first and you share your journey and you share your story, there's value in your testimony. There's value in that. And so this type of preaching isn't preaching over, it's preaching to. And we preach to by making connections. And unfortunately, we do live in a moment. I don't want to say these words intentionally, but right now, especially in an election cycle, religion gets so politicized. On both sides of the aisle, all over, everything, religion gets hyper-politicized. And certain moral values get emphasized. All of a sudden, it feels like any faith conversation gets wrapped up in the couple issues that are like main sticking points in that election cycle. We get hyper-focused on these limited components to our faith can get really divisive. We even draw lines within our faith. We create fresh new lines of division. It can be hyper politicized. And um, so then all of a sudden, Jesus conversations find themselves in the political space, not the personal space. And I would advise, and I think that as a church, I want to keep Jesus in the personal space because he worked very, very hard to not be a political tool. Again, read the gospel. He made significant effort. He, he, he brought in a diversity of views within his disciples. It's on far as extremes of having a zealot and a tax collector on the same group. I mean, he would go out of his way to not become a pawn of political leaders. He worked very, very difficult to stay sort of centrist and avoid that. And we are coming up on a year where I would love for faith conversations to not just be political but stay personal because Jesus cares about the one. He cares about the person. And I actually, I just feel led to ask this question. Do you feel truly in your heart like somebody can come to Jesus and be fully saved without changing their current political ideologies? Do you believe that somebody could experience and encounter the presence of God and not change and align with all of your political beliefs and sit right next to you and you'd be okay with it? That is a helpful question if you want to live missionally. Because living missionally means living with people who don't agree with you on everything. It means engaging relationally with people that aren't in perfect alignment. And here's the issue. If you stay in community long enough, you're going to find out none of us are perfectly aligned. <laughs> We've all got differing views on all types of different things and these different nuances. But can somebody accept Jesus? Can they fully do that? And, and can we make the conversation come back to Jesus, back to Jesus, back to Jesus? It's such an important thing. I'm not saying don't be active politically, don't have your views. I'm not saying any of that, but be very careful to politicize Jesus because we might isolate whole groups of people who are desperate for the message of Jesus. We need to be careful there. Amen? Amen. Nothing's more personal than a conversation about Jesus. And then another question as we cruise here, who will love them? Who will love them? Again, think about who are they? 
Maybe they're family members in your mind right now who will love them. John 13, 34 through 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is this mark of what it means to even be a disciple of Jesus. You, you actually can't love others effectively if you don't understand love within the community of faith. There's so much in this passage. We know that Jesus, he actually did define love for us very clearly. He said, love is laying your life down for other people. It's selfless, it's serving, it's submissive, it's caring. It's putting the needs of others before your own needs. And so missional living requires loving examples. You cannot say you agree to Jesus' definition of love without even attempting to live it out. See, one of the ways we could be marked as posers, if you will, is if we are saying, hey, we want to love you, but we can't even love each other. Like, we have to figure out how to even love each other as an example. That's how people are going to know we are his disciples, is the way in which we love one another. If love is laying your life down for others... Our potential hypocrisy is on the line when people look in at how we act relationally. 1 Corinthians 13, starting verse 3, is a famous section of Scripture, but all of 1 Corinthians 13 is about love, and it, and it breaks it down. I'm not going to go there for the sake of time. But there's a couple things that it says that love is not, and I actually want to highlight these for a moment. And I love that 1 Corinthians tells us what love is, but more importantly, what love is not and does not do slash represent. One of the things it says is it says real love does not envy. So let me suggest a thought then. If love does not envy, could it be that you cannot reach the person you're jealous of? If it doesn't envy, does envy and jealousy actually cut you off from an ability to reach that person? So that person you're trying to reach, is there a bit of envy in your heart? Check that. Ask God about that. Work that out. That's another thing too, right? Sometimes questions like that, we're like, ooh, I don't want to admit to something like that. That sounds kind of, I think it's so vital to be honest with your emotions. One of the best filters Renee and I heard from a pastor named Paul Scanlon, he said this about feelings and emotions. He says, feelings and emotions, they are data. They're not directive. So it's important to go, hey, this is data. Why did I feel envious? That's data. It's not directive to then go and get what they have. But it is data, and it's helpful to go, what does that mean? Like, why did I feel that? I'm not evil because I had that feeling or that temptation rise up. I'm only evil if I respond to it. I, I, God, help me. Why is that in me? Search me and know me. Is there anything that's ill-fitting? Like, is this, what's going on in my heart? So love does not envy. This chapter also reminds us that real love does not boast. Could it be that it's going to be really, really hard to reach the person you're bragging to? Bragging how good your life is. Bragging what you get to do. Talking about it. Talking about your family unit. Maybe their family's a mess. And, you, and you're, you're, you're always post, and you feel a little braggy about how good your family is, how great your kids are. You cannot reach the person you're bragging to. Real love doesn't do that. It says real love is not rude. This one convicted me, guys. <laughs> You cannot reach the person that you're rude to. <laughs> like this one's, this is challenging. <laughs> Sometimes people are crazy and ridiculous, okay? And they're slow and they don't drive very well and they don't know how to do their job very effectively. And, and it can feel really easy to be rude. But... Real love's not rude, it's patient. And so we sit in that space. And we're supposed to show patience, live missionally. Real love is not irritable, it teaches us. You cannot reach people when you're crabby. <laughs> Some of y'all are just crabby too much. You're not very likable sometimes. We've got to work on that. Okay, I've got, maybe I've got real valid reasons for being crabby, but again, am I going to live that way? Am I going to take that as data, or am I going to make that directive? I want to make changes. Ben can come on up. Real love doesn't hold a grudge. 
That means you can't reach people you are offended at. This is where we come back to that political space because I'm just going to tell you the target is political leaders want you offended at the other side. So they want you to not just disagree. They want you to hold a grudge. So you have to be careful. Actually pay attention to what people are trying to fuel in you. Right? So if people are trying to get you to act because they created fear in you, you should pay attention to that. Don't ever let somebody motivate you by fear. You're a person of faith. We don't do that. When someone's trying to motivate you through division, you go, no, I'm a person of unity. My motivation won't be division. My motivation's gonna be unity. And in the same way, if people, if, if, if the motivation of a leader is to get you to dislike somebody, to hold a grudge, to live offended, you need to pay attention to that. Don't do it. Can't reach people you are offended at. Two more questions we're gonna hit really fast. Who will get ready? First Peter chapter three, Verse 15 through 16. Now this question goes back to you. Are you going to get ready? But in your heart to revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Are you prepared to give an answer for why you have hope in your life? Why do you have hope? Why haven't you given into fear? Why haven't you given into negativity? Why, why do you still have hope? Do you know why? But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. The way in which we do this, the way in which, look at, look at, look at. So do we come at people and tell them about the hope in an angry way? Malicious, intense, boastful? No, no, no. We actually talk about the hope with gentleness and respect. Why well, I don't respect their, their beliefs, Pastor Sam. Okay, but do you respect God's creation? Because if I respect God's creation, that value, the value of humanity, come on, we believe and we value the sanctity of life. Their life matters. So can I place the value of God's creation above their current beliefs and views enough to talk with them about gentleness and respect, respect for the hope I have in Jesus? Can I show them that kind of respect and love? And when we do that, it keeps our conscience clear and it makes them really hard. It makes it really hard for people to call us a hypocrite, to call us a poser, to call us out. Prepared here is an important word. It means you put in preemptive work. There is too much amazing content on scripture for us to be uninformed. If you're like, I don't even know where to start, Pastor Sam. Just go to Bible Project. Great place to start. Amazing. Start studying. Start watching the videos. Start doing the reading plans. Read the gospels. Get prepared. Ask hard questions. Find people in the church that know more about the word than you. we got some amazing biblical scholar level minds in our church. Find it, get connected, go to, go to tables, go to men's discipleship, sign up for those deeper parts of faith, those formation areas. When you are not prepared, you avoid living missionally because you're afraid of the question. So the people that you're thinking of, when you're not prepared, you're like, oh, I'm kind of scared of that faith conversation because I don't have good answers right now. Then put in the work. Don't watch Netflix, watch Bible Project for a little while. Come on, Manny Orango, we bring him in, Pastor Manny, we bring him in every single year, ARMA courses. Sign up, $10 a month, same price as a Netflix subscription, and you can take doctorate level Bible courses that are prepared for a church attender, not a pastor. You're gonna come out with literally the knowledge you need. Go get it, go after it. Don't be lazy. Laziness always leads to future avoidance. It's putting things off and you need to have those answers. I don't know. I've just found, you see, we, we understand that Jesus, he's actually going after the one. He's trying, the people you're thinking of, he's trying to reach right now. Whether you help him or he's going out, he wants you to help him in that cause. What I found is that when I get prepared, he sends them. When I'm prepared, once I'm ready, they just show up. And all of a sudden I'm in a conversation. I'm like, I just watched the video actually and just heard this and I got this. When you get prepared, he sends them. And then the last one is, right? We talk all about Project 42, reaching the unreached. And the last story I was really impacted a few weeks ago. I got invited, um, there's, 
this, uh, this ministry that's entirely focused on reaching hockey players. If you don't know, hockey culture uh, is very all pervasive. It becomes your whole world. And by the time kids get to high school, they don't have time for anything else. And, and uh, this ministry is going after hockey players. And I got invited just to go share um, and, and teach. They, uh, the Blaine Varsity hockey team had this optional Bible study that this, uh, that this ministry leader from the hockey group is, was doing. And he said, will you come and share this? And I'm like, how many guys are actually gonna show up to an optional post-practice? They had school all day. <clears throat> then they're, you know, they're practice, showered off. It's almost dinner time. And 16 of the players showed up. And I'm sitting there and I'm getting to know the boys and I'm asking them questions. And I'm finding out none of these kids are youth group kids. Like they don't know the first thing about the Bible. I was just asking like baseline questions. I'm going, these kids are like, they're actually unreached. Something just lit in my spirit as I'm having this conversation and they're interested about faith and, you know, answers to questions. It's like, I'm like trying to lead them to think about, you know, morality and stuff like that. And their answers are like, yeah, I guess like, I guess what that would mean is like, I could swear less. And I'm like, yes, that's a step in the less swearing would be good. Yeah, 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 let's talk about, right? Like that level answers. And I walked out, I called Renee Amita, I was so impacted. And I was like, this ministry is, it's reaching unreached in our community. This idea that they're only overseas, we gotta stop. There are so many people, they don't don't know the first thing about Jesus. They only know his name. They only know his name. They don't know anything about him. So I wonder who will go where the gospel isn't because right now the gospel isn't in certain cubicles. The gospel isn't in certain companies. The gospel isn't in certain schools. The gospel isn't in certain sports environments. The gospel isn't everywhere. The moment we think the work is done in America, we sit back and we stop with missional living. I have some helpers with a quick illustration here. So then... I went to a breakfast for this hockey ministry last week and I was just processing it and I was thinking about as a church how we view evangelism really, really matters. How we view this sort of outreach value that we have really, really matters. And what I was realizing is that this ministry, for example, was a ministry that is able to go into the space of the hockey world to meet these boys where they're at and bring it to them. And one of the challenges that we can have sometimes is that when we view evangelism, when we view outreach, the thing we might think about is, let's say this over here, this is my space. This is, this is my holy space. This is my church. This is this. This is Sunday morning. We go evangelism is just getting people here. So they're all the way over here. They're in their space. They're living their life. They're living their world, trying to figure out solutions to life. Here they are. They're in their space. That's great. I'm over here in my space. What is this? What does this look like? How do I? How do I reach them? And so we do. And 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 our church will always value. Okay, let's let's invite them to church on Easter. Let's take an invite card but realize the jump. That's a large jump to go all the way from here I am and they're they're in their space all the way to I'm gonna go into your world fully where I feel uncomfortable, where I don't understand the culture, where I don't get the words, where I don't know. That's a big jump. Then there's also this neutral space, this neutral space. And we do some events as a church that meet them in the neutral space. A great example of it would be our golf classic, where it's a chance where we can, you can invite, most guys fill out a foursome and they invite, because guess what, it's golf. It's, it's, it's at the refuge, it's neutral space. The hockey social, we do, it's neutral space. Pickleball social, neutral space. Different things we do. Different women's socials that have gone into Oliver's and done a brunch. It's neutral space, right? So, so it's, hey, come meet me in the space you know and love. And there's this challenge of understanding what does it look like to have moments where I'm actually going into their space, meeting them where they're at, loving them where they are, figuring out how to do this in a healthy way, because we need some people that are willing to go into uncomfortable situations and go find some people and get into their space 
and understand their world. This is actually why, uh, you know, some churches don't ever support parachurch organizations. I actually believe in parachurch organizations. Did you know, why do we, why do we give to, to a lift up? Because lift up doesn't have church in its name. So they can actually go into certain spaces that because I have pastor, because I have church, they won't let me in. Because you're just going to proselytize. We don't want you, but we have to support sometimes organizations and individuals and people who can get into their space. And then as a church, we can create neutral spaces. We can create moments where we're going out in the community. We're there. Here we are. Do you want to join in? We can get into their space through serving, serve day, different outreaches we do. Obviously, yeah, we'd love for them to come. When we're talking about evangelism at Artisan Church, we don't just mean inviting them here. I just don't, I just don't. You know, the name that I, I listed earlier, Eric, he, somebody that I did, I, I met for the first time a year ago and, and it's been a long journey, little, little moments, little, little bits, little faith conversations in the locker room, little, little things. I got him to come to a hockey social and he just said straight up, he goes, I'll come, but I need you to know, I need you to know, um, I'm not a man of faith at all. I don't do any of that church stuff, but I'll play hockey. I'm like, okay, come get around us. Come get around us. And I'm watching his demeanor towards me change over time, little by little, little by little, right? Sometimes you have to get into their space for a while. Sometimes you need to invite them to a neutral space to have a conversation, even before you say, hey, come into my world, come into my space. Let's be willing to go on the journey with them. You can grab that. Let's go on the journey with them. So let's take a moment and process this through to not just accept the message, but live it. And then not just live the message, but actually preach it vocally. And not to just preach to people, but actually love people. What does it look like? What does it look like? Who's gonna tell them? Who's gonna love them? Who's going to tell them about Jesus? Who's going to reach down where they're at? Who's going to meet them? Who's willing to go to some spaces where they are and say, I love you and you matter and you have value and I'm going to do this with respect. I'm going to be prepared to tell them about the hope I have found in Jesus. Why don't you stand to your feet, church? And I want to respond in a worship song. And I want us to actually believe and to begin to think and to declare about the power of the living God. We serve a God who is alive and who can meet people there. And you might think about those names and those faces and those people, and it may feel impossible by your strength, but we need to take a moment and be reminded that God is gonna be with us in this endeavor, that he cares about the one. He wants to go with us in this, and we need to live missionally. We need to figure out ways to express our faith to the world around us, maybe a fresh way, a new way, to reach people, to love people, to care about people. Come on church, let's respond and let's begin to worship. Let's begin to pray for those people, lift up those names. Jesus, come on.